Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we begin this morning's study in the book of Numbers, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his revealed wisdom so that we may more properly understand the symbols that we're going to see here and their interrelation to what we're seeing in Judges chapter 11. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you and we thank you for we know that our, our mercies are new every morning. We pray for your mercy upon our minds that have been darkened for 6,000 years of sin. We ask that our minds may become enlightened from the symbols that you are showing in these chapters, in these different books. Help us today as we, as we look to study Numbers chapter 22. May this chapter reunite us with you. May it help us to understand that what you would have us to see. Direct us now, guide us, each one that are in this meeting, so that we may, be, may more properly have the experience of iron sharpening iron, so that we're more prepared for the message that you would have us to give. I pray for each one that is here today. I ask your blessing upon us all. May your spirit attend us. May your angels protect us. Show us that which we need to understand for this time in earth's history. For this we thank you, for this we praise you, now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, yesterday, as we were addressing Judges chapter 11, there was a question that I had raised whether some of what we were seeing in this book was interrelated to the story of Balaam. So now we have before us Numbers chapter 22. Now we understand the, the symbol of 22. So it's interesting that Judges 11, half of 22, would lead us back to Numbers 22. And now we have symbols to look at afresh here. Now, as the translators had seen this, had seen this chapter, the Israelites encamp in the plains of Moab. Now we have Balak's first message for Balaam is refused. In verse 13, we see that his second message prevails. In verse beginning in verse 22, we have an angel that approacheth Balaam on the way. His ass seeth the angel and endeavoreth to avoid him. Balaam smiteth the ass. God openeth the ass's mouth. The angel reproveth Balaam, but suffereth him to proceed on his journey. And verse 36, Balak goes out to meet him. It's kind of interesting when I look at these that It is 13 verses between the first message and the prevailing of the second message. And those 13 verses may well be a symbol of rebellion. But let's see what other symbols we may find within this chapter. 
And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side of the Jordan by Jericho. So when it's saying this side Jordan by Jericho, are we saying that they are encamped on the east of the Jordan? Yes, yeah, so they're on the east side of the Jordan. Okay. We need to remember that because this is taking place before the death of Moses. Mm -hmm. Moses was not allowed to go forward into the promised land. So this event has to be on the east of the Jordan. Yeah, so specifically, this is, now this is after the death of Aaron or before? I would have to say it's before. So before the death of Aaron, too. Okay. Because, oh, Miriam dies in Numbers 20. Um, and then... Yeah, and Aaron dies it at the end of Numbers 20. So it's after the death of Aaron. Because Aaron dies on the first day of the fifth month, and then they're going to mourn him, mourn him for 30 days. So we would be after the first day of the sixth month in the 40th year. Yes, that's what I would understand here. So, um, just to be more precise about that, um, yeah, because he dies on the first of the fifth. So let's look here. <laughs> yeah, so they're going to mourn, mourn him. Uh, to the first day of the sixth month, which is September 5th, or no, pardon me, September 19th, Julian, uh, 1534 BC. So it's going to be after that. Um, and so they're going to have that happen, and then they're going to have Numbers 21, uh, dealing with the king of Arad. Um, and then the bronze serpent is going to happen. Then the song of the well. Then Sion, King Sion is defeated. And King Og is defeated. So, so it would have to be... Um, we don't know exactly when Moses dies, correct? Correct. Um, we we, we kind of narrowed it down. I can't remember... Uh, where we placed it, but yeah, he gives his uh, Deuteronomy. Yeah, he has his, his sermons there take place in the eleventh month. Yeah, so we don't know the exact day that he dies, but it's in the eleventh month. Correct. Okay, so all of these events are taking place. We could say within a within about a five month span yeah well from the yes yeah, the sixth uh to the tenth so six seven eight nine ten yeah so about a five month span um that you're going to have this occur so this is going to be um you know it's always going to take time for what happens here and then the rebellion at Baal Peor 
Um, so there's quite a few things that actually happen in this period of time. Quite a few things are going to happen in this very short period of time. Yeah. Okay. So as, as we begin looking at this, we now come to the next change of subject. The children of Israel pitched in the plains of Moab on this side Jordan by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. Now, this is Numbers 22-2. Balak, whose name means waster, is seeing all that is, is happening, is seeing all that Israel has been doing to the Amorites. Now, he is the son of Zippor. What does Zippor mean? Sparrow. So, we have the waster, the son of the sparrow, is seeing that which is done to the Amorites. Now, what kind of a message would we see that could properly be given the title, the waster? As we go through further in this book, we may well have to make a determination about this. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, now shall this company lick up all that are round about us as the ox licketh up the grass of the field and Balak the son of Zippor was king of the Moabites at that time so the waster was the leader of the Moabites now do we recall well exactly who the Moabites were Well, it's the son of Lot by his eldest daughter. Okay. So that's descended from there. So, in a manner of speaking, the Moabites were cousins. Uh -huh. Why would the Moabites appeal unto the elders of Midian? <coughs> I mean, they're relatives as well, but um, is there some other reason? Well, would the Midian would would the Midianites had, at that time have been considered children of the East? Well, possibly. Um, Yeah, so they would be the children of the East, I would think. Um, now, you also have the Ammonites, which can be considered the children of the East. 
So there's four different groups, uh, according to what I'm reading here. Um, and one of those groups can be can, the Midianites. But we're seeing the, the war that's gone on against the Amorites. Now we have the Moabites and the elders of Midian. And all are being introduced in this story. So, as we look at all of these, these situations, there is much for us to consider. Now, Balak, he sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come forth from, out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Now, as we look at this, we now have the introduction of Balaam. Now, Balaam's father's name is presented several different ways within scripture. But the name of Balaam can be foreigner, not of the people, So, how should we look at this? What message is it that we would look at that is not of the people? <coughs> Bless you. Is it possible that any message that is not supporting July 18th is not of the people? Are we going to deal with a situation that this could be a, the message of Trump being reelected, not of the people? It's kind of interesting. The Hebrew number for Balaam is 1109. Okay. So November 9th. Mm -hmm. Or September 11th. Right. Either one. Yeah. So in this, we have one that is not of the people who is the son of the lamp or the son of burning. Who lives, lives in Pethore. Which is by the river of the land of the children of his people. What's being referred to here? As the river of the land of the children of his people. Is this the Euphrates? What, yeah. is, what does this mean in the Hebrew? Well, it doesn't really tell us much in the Hebrew. It's just the river of the land. So it doesn't. Um, So it's uh, it's a river, according to what I'm reading here, uh, Segura, which is near its junction with the Euphrates. So it's uh, a river that connects to the Euphrates. 
according to one source. Because of where he's from, that's where the river would be. Okay. But if we have, if we are seeing this, that this is light that is not of the people, is this not a light that is leading the people in the wrong path? Well, it's definitely, I mean, we know that already. Um, I mean, one of the comments in the chat <clears throat> gave reference to this with, with the name of Balak. Ah. And, and what the, the, the comment was, was, does this have an interrelationship with Revelation chapter 9, specifically with verse 11? I mean, we've always, you know, dealt with that 9-11 verse dealing with Abaddon um, and Apollyon, right, which means uh, uh, destroyer. So is Balak an early example of Apollyon? I mean, my, my understanding in that era is that we had always applied this as being part of Islam from Revelation 9-11. Am I wrong in that? Is my memory faulty? Okay, the alternate Hebrew, behold, they covered the eye of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I want that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. <clears throat> so Balak is looking for the children of Israel to be cursed. He understands that Balaam, when he blesses a people, the people are mightily blessed. But when he curses them, that they are mightily cursed. Yeah, so the question, the comment there is regarding the word I. Correct. Um, which, it, because it does refer to a spring or a fountain as well. Now, most of the time when you have, because they're translating in the King James as face of the earth. And uh, most of the time when you're dealing with... Um, the face of the earth, you're going to have um, the word uh, panim, right, which is is face, right? So you're going to, and here you have this word ayim, which means eye or a spring or a well. And, and because a spring or a well, because the eye can cry, right? So it's kind of weird that they use here the eye of the earth rather than the face of the earth. I'm not sure what that means, but I would, you know, if I was translating uh, from English, because I used to practice this, trying to recreate the Hebrew looking at the King James, 
and if I'd seen that phrase face of the earth, I would have assumed that it's Paim, Panim, um, not Ain. So, so it's kind of an unusual uh, expression. So it's Could it be there to remind us of the well of the seven times, Beersheba? So the 2520? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, obviously there would be connection there. Uh, the well of the oath um, in some way. Yeah, yeah it's just... Okay, <clears throat> so Balak has appealed to the Midianites because the children of Israel have now come in to the land of Moab. And he believes that they are too mighty for the Moabites. Why, in this type of a situation, why would he have this type of an attitude? Because if you're standing on a promontory, on a high place, overlooking the encampment of these, of these people, you will see that there are flocks, there are herds, there are people, there are animals, there are tents. What is it about this that strikes fear into Balak? Why is the one that is the waster scared? I mean, we understand well that this is going to lead for them to become very duplicitous. They have to introduce from through craft that which they cannot accomplish directly. Yeah, you know, I mean, so we know there is, you know, Balak is going to ask Balaam to curse Israel, which <clears throat> I wonder what that particularly means. I mean, why would he do this? What is he trying to accomplish? You know, to have somebody come and just curse a people. I mean, I'm not sure what religion, religious aspect this is. But, you know, it, it just seems kind of an odd thing. He's not looking for some military help. He's just looking for him to curse Israel. Well, if the curse comes upon the people, is that not also removing from them the blessing that God has given them or attempting to get them to turn from the blessing that God has offered? Yeah, and, and he knows about Balaam, at least he says, that he whom thou bless, blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. Um, so, so obviously Balaam has this reputation. Okay. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> as we go through this, the, the situation of he sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam is recalled again in Deuteronomy 23, 4, 2, 3, 4. 
because they meet you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor of Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. Joshua 13, 22. Balaam, also the son of Beor, the soothsayer, did the children of Israel slay with the sword among them that were slain by them. Joshua 24, 9. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. Nehemiah 13, 1 and 13. On that day, they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people. And therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them that he should curse them. How be it our God turn the curse into a blessing. <clears throat> Why is this portion from Nehemiah so important for us in this example? Is this not reminding the children of Israel of the everlasting promises and providence of our Heavenly Father? These people, the Moabites, had they met the children of Israel with bread and with water to sustain them of, on their journey? Would they then have not received part of the blessing given to Israel? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we have bread and water, which is our symbols, and we have these curses. Um, I know I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to figure something out here. Okay. So, I mean, this, this understanding dealing with Balaam, um, it came in, um, see, I'm trying to remember when it was. So I believe it was, I know in 2015 that that it was understood to some degree. Um, and I always get this mixed up. So in 2000 and, because when did we first make the prediction that Islam was going to, um, to strike the United States, this prediction regarding uh, Islam. does Because uh, I always get it mixed up. Can't remember if it was, because Jeff was in, in um, uh, I believe it was Austria or someplace like that. He was in Wales as well. It was at the end of a year. I think it's the time when um, his son came to visit him came to the meetings and uh, that meeting in the wheels was December 2014. Okay. So it was 2014 because I always get that mixed up. So it's good. Yeah. Right. So it's going to be in the summer of 2014. That. See, I'm trying because it doesn't make sense to me, the, the technology of this. Um, because they, they're going to, to have this idea that they're going to make a prediction regarding Islam. Right? That, 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 and that was connected to the understanding of Numbers 22. Do you remember, Stephen, how that came about? Yeah, wasn't it? Um, they were measuring times and stuff as well between meetings around that time. There was like 1,260 days being measured. I can't remember. But um, yeah, not actually very fair. Yeah. That's how that came about. I think it was, the, are you sure it wasn't the end of 2000? 
So you're saying it's the end of 2014, right? Yes, because I was going to go to that camp meeting. Okay, okay. I... Now, now it clicks. Now it's clicking. So, yeah, because in 2014, I had met um, uh, Mark Bruce. He came to the camp meeting where I presented uh, chronology in Alberta, and then I was invited in 2014. We went to uh, Arkansas, Heidi and I, and, uh, and one of my daughters. We went there. And I presented on chronology for the first time to the movement at large at that camp meeting. And then I remember the next year, 2015, um, talking with Jeff when he came to the Alberta camp meeting again. And we were talking about Mark Bruce, and he was saying that Mark Bruce said he was going to figure it out, you know, this sort of prediction thing. So, yeah, so it would have been at the end of 2014. Um, so... Now, did it come specifically from studying um, Numbers 22, or was there some other connection? Because um, I remember in 2016, Stephen, when you and I were at the School of the Prophets, um, this was this was and it had been an area area of study. And maybe did the study of Balaam come after after the the revelation in December of 2014 that it sort of developed from that or was it instrumental in bringing about that prediction that's what I don't know because I kind of missed that history a bit yeah they were in Austria and they were yeah. studying history in Vienna and that was where the siege of uh, Vienna occurred um, they were looking at that history then because that was the like the furthest extent, because Islam was part of the topic then. So I kind of was that was that in two thousand fourteen that Austria meeting. Yeah, because it was connect. Yeah, it was at the end there. So he was in Wales and he was also in Austria. I I know that um, Clayton actually showed up at the Wales meeting, I believe. Yes. But but Jeff also was in Austria, and and there was also. Um, an issue there that had arisen regarding uh, my understanding. Uh, I believe it was then, might have been the next year. Anyway, uh, so in 2014, anyway, we know that that's when this idea that there was going to be this prediction was made. I think it was the next year that there were some other issues that arose. But, um, but I just don't understand the part that Numbers 22 had to play in that because I wasn't following closely enough. And, and I never did understand fully um, this prophecy of Balaam and how Jeff understood it. Because there seemed to be a number of differences that, uh, that existed in people's understanding. So it, was, it wasn't really a controversy, but it just it wasn't clear what position the movement had taken regarding uh, this. In its details, in the Broadway, yeah, it was there was kind of an agreement that there was these three strikes of Islam, and so that there was going to be a prediction regarding Islam attacking the United States, which is why when when we came up with uh, you know November 9th and July 18th, we were looking at these as being Islam. Okay. <clears throat> Do these verses from Nehemiah help us in this understanding? I mean, we're, we're dealing here because Nehemiah, as they read the book of the law, the book of Moses, to the people, they're showing that the Ammonite and the Moabite are not to be part of the congregation. So the sons of Lot, even though they are cousins, are not to have part in this situation, in this worship of God. 
They did not welcome the children of Israel as they came out of Egypt, but they chose to battle against them. They did not welcome the message. They did everything possible not <clears throat> to accept the message. Now, the other verses that were being applied here. Micah 6, 5. O oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted. <clears throat> and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. 2 Peter 2, 15 which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. The messages that take us away from an understanding of July 18th, from a true understanding of righteousness by faith, are messages which love the wages of unrighteousness. Jude one eleven. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. And then finally, Revelation 2.14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So this story of Balaam, is being compared to what church in Revelation? Well, um, this is going to be the second church. Uh, I was thinking it's either the fourth or the fifth. Um, well, this is Revelation. Ira, Ira. Okay, so it's Thyatira. So that's the, the fourth then, yeah. Okay. Uh, wait, no, this is uh, 2.14? Yeah. It's going to be Pergamum. Pergamum. And which church is that? That's the third. The third, okay. Uh, I'm reading Revelation uh, 2, and it does talk about Thyatira. Yeah. Thou sufferest that woman Isabel, which called the example of prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. That's 220. Yeah, so you're going to have the same type of thing in, in Thyatira as well, as she's pointing out in Revelation 2.20. So that's um, that would be the... Uh, Thyatira, which is the 1260, it's a restoration of paganism, which is being described in the Pergamum church. All right. And where do we generally place Pergamum? Where do, where do we start it? We know we ended it in 538, but where do we start it? Wouldn't it have been about 321? Okay, so because of verse 2, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Um, so is this, is we, we sort of mark it in connection with um, the movement of uh, the capital Rome of Rome, the Roman Empire, from the city of Rome to Constantinople. At least that's how I understood it. I never, it, what year is that? That's... Um, 330. Uh, 330? Okay. Yes. Yeah. 
So that's generally where I have placed it. I don't know if we would put it earlier. But I think some people would put it to the Edict of Constantine in 313. Okay. Yeah, so I've seen different different places. So anyway, it's going to be connected with Constantine. Right, the start of it. Okay. However, we look at it, um, and and this is going to be um, then that that false worship. Of course, Sunday is and so forth uh, being manifest. But um, so that's where we're going to have this reference to Balaam and Balak. Okay. It was intriguing to me when, when I was putting this together. Because in the footnotes, when we address the son of Beor to Pethor, the translators gave reference to Numbers 23.7 and Deuteronomy 23.4. Now, 23.4 was addressed at the outset of this last footnote. But 23.7 kind of bookends these. Because as it reads, and he took up his parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, hath brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, come Curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. Yeah, Aram's usually uh, translated as Syria, but here they just okay. leave the Hebrew. <clears throat> so in Numbers 23 7, this is being seen as being offered as a parable. Now, if it's being offered as a parable, is this possibly also a prophecy for today. Something for us to pay attention to. <clears throat> so as we continue, Numbers 22.7. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. And they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian have joined together to come before Balaam. We have a confederacy. that are coming before Balaam to attempt to get him to curse the children of Israel. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. <clears throat> Take the time. Stay with me. Let me inquire of the Lord. And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? Now, is this not a symbol again of an investigation? God well knew because he is all seeing exactly who these people were. But he says to Balaam, what men are these with thee? What can we take from this verse? Now, if we were if we were to look at this the way that the translators had, we would hearken back to Genesis 20, verse 3. 
But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Along with this, we have Numbers 22, 20. And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that thou shalt do. God says to Balaam, who are these men with thee? What is the message that you have presented before you? Now, noted in the, in the chat, 1 Kings 12, 7. Why? Regarding lodging, it says, The king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. So you have the offer of hospitality and bribery there, similar to what's happening here. Okay. <clears throat> And Balaam said unto to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, hath sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me, them. Peradventure, I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. But the alternate Hebrew would read, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure, I shall prevail in fighting against them and drive them out. First, Balak is saying, they are too great for me. Now he wants them cursed and he wants them cursed by one that claims to represent God so that he can overcome them. How many different times have we had those that have come to the movement thinking that they have a more correct or a better message? What message can we see here where Balak wants Balaam to curse the movement? We can see subversion there. He's telling him as a representative of God to curse the people of God. So be a traitor. I will reward you. Okay. And if you know anything about curses, this, the uh, people who believe in Satan, people who believe in these things, they know how powerful these curses can be. They also know they can be deflected by people who are wary of them and in tune with God. I've had lots of curses placed on me, and I knew where they came from. I knew who was doing it. And later I found out why they were put on me because one of the people who was from the opposite side came and told me. So I'm, I, that's why I constantly pray for the shield of God over me. If they can bring sickness, they can bring uh, near death. Like I was in a, a crash once, it just came out of nowhere. And I was on hurt, my children were on hurt, but I knew immediately why that happened. And it was confirmed about a year or so later, who it came from. 
So beware. I know of plenty of people that have had curses put on them and they describe how God recovered them from those curses. It's just yeah. absolutely amazing. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't, I don't quite agree with you that say I, I experienced it. I experienced it. I can attest to it. Let me finish. finish. Let me finish, please. I said, I don't quite agree with you that we need to be fearful of these types of things because um, we know that it says that we can take up serpents and not be harmed. And, and what I understand this to be is that um, Satan really has no power but the power of deception. He can't do anything other than to deceive. And people who get caught up in, and, and I have a lot of experience in this, from, from the past, uh, before I was an Adventist, um, of people who were involved in this type of thing, exorcism and, and witchcraft. And um, it, there is, when a person believes in these things, that's when the danger really arises. And uh, I know many Pentecostals who, in and I even know some Adventists who were involved in, you know, countering the work of Satan, you know, curses and things like that. And they actually, in the end, um, uh, became demon-possessed. And so I think it's, I think what we need to see is that uh, the curses, all this witchcraft and things like that, can have no power over the children of God. Because it's Many just, it's just a deception. Yeah, but I'm saying it's a deception, is what it is. Um, they do exist, whether you want to believe that okay. or not. And we okay. need to be armed against them. I mean, uh, if Jesus Christ spent hours and nights in prayer to his Father, was he not praying for protection, endurance, safety? Yeah, but he wasn't protected. <laughs> Okay, here's an example. Uh, Bill Aversage, I don't know if you know he, who he was or is. I no idea. So he was a missionary to um, Papua New Guinea, and, and he dealt with this type of things with the witch doctors. And there's no doubt that uh, these, these Sanguma men, as they called them, the Sanguma men, had power over the people. Um, but in his experience, as he he uh, dealt with this, is he just he knew that he was protected by God. And one of the things he did, um, there would be this sanguma tree. This is where they would put these smoked dead bodies of people that the sanguma man had killed through his various uh, types of witchcraft. And they take these smoked bodies and hang them on this tree. And Bill of Versage, uh, um to show the power of God over Satan, he actually s slept under the sa uh, the sanguma tree with his feet on the tree, and uh, nothing happened to him. This converted the entire village. It's it's actually a very interesting story, but he talks about because after being in Papua New Guinea, he ended up uh, doing work. I believe it was in San Francisco, but I, I could be wrong. Which city in the U.S. that he worked in? But he says, you see the same type of thing. And so what Satan has done is he has deceived people about his power. And, and so personally, I think it's a dangerous thing to attribute to Satan power that God has never given him. The only power Satan has is the power of deception. And, and so personally, I think it's quite a dangerous thing to believe that Satan actually has mystical powers. I don't believe he does. And what about where Christ healed a woman who had suffered for 18 years, I think it was. He said, whom the power of Satan has bound. He has more yeah. than power to deceive. He does have power to afflict, but he cannot go beyond the bounds that God has set for him. And when people are disobeying the Lord in whatever way they are disobeying him, they're opening up a, a, a way for Satan to attack them. Exactly. I'm very well aware of this. I've been yeah. involved for so long. So somebody who's obeying God has no fear over the power of Satan. Satan can't do My, my fear is not of, of demons. I, I have seen them. I've conversed with them and stuff like that. I, I don't have fear of them because I know Christ has power over them. I do have a fear of stepping out of line and that that would give them license to, to afflict me. 
or yeah. or yeah. my loved one. Right. So the, so the important thing is to obey God, not to fear Satan, not to fear. Right. I, I know people who are constantly afraid that you know Satan's going to do something to them, um, and and. And, and in a sense, they're really involved in witchcraft. I mean, they use the Bible they and, are. as as if it's some kind mm -hmm. of talisman. They use the scripture as if it's some type of magic spell to protect them. The only safety we have is in obedience. They wear crosses and stuff. I know. I right. know this. Right. And that, so so I if we, like so if we are obedient to God, we have nothing to fear from Satan. If we obey the truth. And are truthful to ourselves and to others. Satan can have no power over us, and so I don't believe that we should be fearing Satan in that sense. That somebody is going to cast a spell upon us, and that we need to make a special prayer uh, for these things. What we need to do is obey God, and then we have all of the protection, all of the protection that we need. And that and concern with this. That's all I'm saying about it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. And God said unto Malam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. Is this not a direct instruction to Balaam? Mm-hmm. It is a two-part instruction. Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse them. You are not to listen to the message that takes you away from my path. The message is a blessed message. And Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your land, for the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose up, and they went unto Balak and said, Balaam refuseth to come with us. Balak was disappointed. Balak saw this as an opportunity to negotiate. And Balak sent yet again princes and more and more honorable than they. So, in 13 verses, a temptation is put before Balaam. A message is placed before Balaam. And these princes, and they came unto Balaam. And said unto him, Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. Don't let anything stop you. This message from Balak is being presented again. With this temptation for Balaam, the message of the waster is come to Balaam. For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people.
Why is it so important that they curse this people? We reference back to Numbers 22, 6. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. First, he sees them as being too mighty. Then he wants a curse upon them so that he can war against them and defeat them. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. But what kind of character does Balaam show? Now, therefore, I pray you, tarry ye also here this night, that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. The word of God has already been specific. You are not to go with them. You are not to curse the people. So with this second group, Balaam again wants to ask, why? Why is he going before the Lord? Because of the offer of these more honorable men sent by Balak. Is this not showing that his character is not like Christ's? That he has greed? That he is he has set his store here rather than in heaven? His mistake was to dally with them at all. Should have just told them to get lost, go back, as he said the first time, and they should have just remained there. Okay. And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up, and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. Why is God allowing Balaam to go with the Moabite and Midianite princes? I think he knew the state of his heart, and he also respected his free will, even though it was a perverse free will. And he, and he thought, nevertheless, I'm going to have my way with this. It, it's very much like First Kings 13. Like what? Like First Kings 13. If you're bent on, on yielding to this temptation, I'm going to try to overrule your choice as much as possible. So if you're if you really want to go with them, go with them. But this is what I'm going to do, despite it, despite that. I thought it was, they might do because he he, uh, he uh, said in his heart to do it anyway, and God was trying to teach him how to do it. William, I could barely hear you. I'm sorry. I said uh, he uh, he probably said in his heart to do it anyway, and, he, and God is going to teach him a lesson. Okay. The um, the permission was on a condition that they were to come back to him. So that there would have to be fulfilled, and then. If that was to take place, then Balaam could go. 
But Ellen White gives information that they didn't come back to him, they just left. And then Balaam followed, followed them by his own. So the, the, the condition wasn't reached for that permission to be given. Okay. Now, there's a posting in the chat. Can somebody please read that? Balaam was once a prophet of God, but he had apostatized and given himself up to covetousness. When the messengers announced their errand, he well knew that it was his duty to refuse the rewards of Balak and dismiss the ambassadors. But he ventured to dally with temptation and urged the messengers to tarry that night, declaring that he could give no answer to he had asked counsel of the Lord. Balaam knew that his curse could not harm Israel, but his pride was flattered by the words, he whom thou blessed is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. The bribe of costly gifts excited his covetousness, and while professing obedience to the will of God, he tried to comply with the desires of Bala. What does EP stand for? 310 one. Eternity I don't know. passed. Eternity passed. Eternity passed. Thank you. So many of these compilations, I don't recall. And yesterday, I really didn't have time to go back into the writings of Sister White to prepare for this. So that may be something I can get accomplished later today. So Chapter 30 in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White goes through numbers 22 to 24. So she covers that history. Okay. So instead of eternity past, you would look, because that's just basically uh, um, a condensation. Condens anyway, it's, it's a shortened version of uh, patriarchs and prophets. Okay. So we come to this verse that says, And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. He's given in to his love of money. He's given in to the flattery. Now, How many times in our lives do we give in to flattery? How many times in our lives do we choose to do something that the Lord would not have us to do? How many times are we representing Balaam where we should be representing Christ? This is a question that we're each going to have to ask ourselves. Um, just to kind of go back, because I've been reading some stuff here and um, looking at how Jeff understood this story. Now, so when we look at Numbers 22, um, so we have Balak and we have Balaam. And... We, we're, we're going to obviously look into this in more detail as we go through this story, but um, these, these events where the angel is trying to stop Balaam in his, in his journey on the ass. So this is Islam, right? We know the ass represents Islam. Right. And there's going to be these three events. And... Um, and we're going to try to understand how Jeff understood this um, and that, that these would be events in our history. And yet, if we're trying to understand who Balaam is, I mean, the question is, who is Balaam? I mean, what is he representing? Well, he would be a prophet, right? 
Yes. Right. But he's, and he's going to test it, like he's not going to be able to curse them. Um, and, and God actually comes to him. So he, he must be a true prophet in some sense of the word. I would say that he had been a prophet, yes. Yeah. So, but now he's going to be distracted from his responsibility by this um, appeal of Balak. And and so we, we, we can take this story and we can look at it as, as you are sort of on a personal level. But uh, I think we would need to try to understand this on a prophetic level. What what does he represent? Um, you know, does he represent some aspect of the church, and or or something else? You know, some aspect of the movement or some specific message. And and I'm not really sure how we should interpret him. The one thing that we have done is we've taken the rebellion at Baal Peor. And we have applied it to uh, Parminder, right? And his message. And what I'm thinking here, and and I could be completely off, but I think that we've to some degree misapplied this story of Balaam, and and we're going to see this when we get into the message of Jephthah further, um, and what that represents, is that this is about a message that is given by someone who is a prophet of God, but this message um, doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really, I mean, because he's not going to curse them, he's actually going to bless them each time. Uh, so we're going to have to try to understand how that applies, you know, historically, either to this movement or to the church or some way. Um, but we've looked at it as this this hindering of Balaam on his journey as these strikes of Islam. But could it necess could it just be about prophecies about Islam? Not necessarily events that occur. I don't know if that makes sense to people. Well, I think Stephen has a comment. Please. Yeah. Well, I was going to say. Um, that the hard being applied to the false prophet being the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And that was, in a sense, it was a lamb like. It was once, in a sense, a prophet of God, figuratively, mm -hmm. but a sense apostatized. So. Yeah, so this is how Jeff did it, right? So, yes. so it's going to represent the United States. And then that's why we have these as strikes of Islam upon the United States. And, and, and maybe Jeff is correct in that, but maybe it could be um, these predictions that we made are part of that. So, uh, you know, I, I'm still uncertain about this, uh, how, how we are to take this, especially as we start to, to place this into the story of Jephthah. Um, because I just don't understand this completely. I don't understand. I don't necessarily understand completely Jeff's position. And it, and if we took it that, you know, because um, I think it was, you know, 9-11 is the first strike and then midnight, midnight cry are the next two strikes. Right. So they're, they're, they're preludes to the Sunday law, to the close of probation, because you have, you know, 9-11 being the first day of the first month, and then, um, you know, midnight being the the second strike, and then midnight cry being the third strike. At least that's how it seemed to me it was being interpreted at, at some point. Um, that's the way I, I think understood it. Okay, so William, you say that that's the way that you had understood it. Stephen? I had understood it. The third strike is the Sunday law, because then okay. you have the, the ass speaking, and, and wow. that was sort of to do with the, the, the speaking of the legislator. Uh, Bilm, speak, Bilm speaks as well, so, so, um, so that was the, the speaking of the legislator mm -hmm. is uh, connected with the, 
the law, the Sunday law. So the other strike was, I think, it was applied to the midnight cry. Okay. Okay. So, so I have seen though the other application at some point. So I'm not sure who or when or how, um, but I would agree that that would make the most sense. Um, the ass speaking being the United States. So, so I'm pretty sure that that's Jeff's interpretation, at least at some point, uh, maybe earlier on, maybe it changed as we uh, got confused with the time setting stuff. But um, so if we take that position, can we look at this, this story having different applications? When you say the ass speaking could be the U.S. making the, making the Sunday law, well, the ass would then be, be the Democrats, right? <laughs> if we're going to carry it that far. Right. So, so that's what I'm saying is there are some levels here that we have to try to, um, to un, unravel. We have to try to separate these things out. Because, you know, we're going to have, uh, obviously, the rebellion at Baal Peor. And we've already made an application of that to internal aspects of the movement. So, so I would think that Jeff's overall understanding of this is correct. But how we have tried to make the application, I mean, uh, there's, there's something that's missing. That's all I, I can see. It doesn't it doesn't all fit together really nicely for me based on what's happened. Based upon how Jeff saw it initially, that made sense. But as things have un, unfolded, um, then maybe somewhere along the line we haven't fully understood it. I don't know. I, I know I'm I'm kind of struggling with this, so expressing my struggle, I don't know if that's helpful for people or not. In this kind of a situation, I, we're going to have to examine these struggles. We're going to have to examine how the application was made and could be made in the light of what has been going on within the movement. Mm -hmm. The the point that that. I was being led to look at just as we have addressed in the past. We need to look at this as to its overall impact. We need to look at this as a message and how that message is applied at this time. Yeah. Well, here's something that Jeff says. So this is in 2015 that Jeff, uh, it's actually um, a Future News Frequently Asked Questions. Okay. A document called Parts 1 and 2, and uh, this is on page 508, so it's quite a large document. But he says, in Numbers 22, just before the children of Israel are to enter the Promised Land, clearly an illustration of the end of the world, there are three enemies, Moab, Balaam and Balak. These are Moses' illustration of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. Balak the king is the ten kings, the civil authority, the dragon power of Revelation 16 and 17. Moab is the papacy, and Balaam is the false prophet. So that's how Jeff applies it. Okay. Would we have a problem with that? I don't think so. The, the problem that we're having is we're dealing with this story of Jephthah, and, and now we're referencing here uh, this because we're asking the question about um, these strikes of Islam, these um, uh, exactly, uh, you were asking if it wasn't uh, which, what was it that was your question you started with at the beginning? Uh, well, 
what's the question we're answering again? More of, of, of what I've been asking has to do with, have we correctly applied this as we have been looking at Judges 11 mm -hmm. with Jephthah? Yeah, and so, but it was the second of, is, are you looking at Jephthah having to do with like second angel's message or third angel's message or something like that? Right. So, so what are we trying to answer here by looking at, at Numbers 22? What specifically are, question are we addressing? Well, the question regarding the crushing of the foot of Balaam, which we're going, we're going to get into tomorrow. Yeah, so that was it. You wanted to know if the crushing of the foot of Balaam, which is the second of these strikes right related to the story of jephthah and is this is this crushing of the foot related more to 9 11 than the turning in the field okay right so, okay that was it so yeah so we're trying to place this these these events and yeah so it's going to take a little bit of time i think to to sort through this, at least for me. It's taking me time. I mean, Elder Jeff had a lot of things that he presented mm -hmm. that many within the movement would accept, but they would not investigate it for themselves. Well, and yeah, and the thing about it, when I look at it, because I believe that Jeff was led by God, but I don't think he, I don't think he fully understood the implications of th some of the things he was presenting. Just like any prophet, uh, you know, can understand what God's revealing in the context of where they are. But you know, Jeff didn't foresee how things have unfolded in the movement. It didn't go the way that he expected, and yet, based upon what he had said. He should have expected it. You understand what I'm saying? No, I agree. Yeah. I mean, just like when we had the July 18, 2020 prediction, and and he compared this to Abraham offering up Isaac, and also uh, to Jonah presenting the message about the destruction of Nineveh. Right. Well, in both of those, he should have seen that the event should not occur. Right. In order for those, those illustrations, you know, Abraham doesn't kill Isaac. You know, his hand is stayed. Um, so, in a sense, we, we can look at also these as restraints, because Jeff talks about these as being restraints of Islam. So, so there are, is some level in which we have to go back and look at what Jeff taught. But we will draw different conclusions than he drew, even though he was correct in his application. Right. Right. That's, that's the way that I see how we're addressing what's happening. Because nowhere are we going to say Jeff was wrong, because he wasn't. Right. In his applications, his applications were correct. The, where the mistake was is not seeing the disappointment. But that's because God had held his hand over that. And then how this movement has been responding to that is parallel to how the movement responded after the disappointment of October 22, 1844. Well, in, in this whole situation, I look at this as being no different than what we've been doing over the last couple of years of examining the foundations. Mm -hmm. Now, as we have gone through the Millerite time, as we have gone through the letters of Samuel Snow, as we have gone through many other points, we have been looking at this, studying this, considering this, eating this, 
so that we may be more ready to understand the light that is yet to be shown. Mm -hmm. And so that we can be better prepared for the message that is to be given. Mm -hmm. Now, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So in this case, no, we are not setting aside what Elder Jeff has done. We are not setting aside what he has had to say. But the re-examination is going to prove, yes, he was led of God. Yes, he is a prophet. I've made this comment many times to many other friends. I have had them many, almost every time telling me that I am deluded in the way that I approach this. But I believe fully that he is a prophet of God, that he was raised up to give a warning message. And now it is a question. Is there something more for us to find? Is there light that has yet to be uncovered light that will help us to understand more clearly the message that is yet to be given. Yeah. Now one thing interesting uh, here. And they're always yeah. yeah. So one one point that's kind of interesting here, which um we will get into when we get into Balaam's prophecy, specifically the one about the star. Right? Because we know that that's going to reference um, the birth of Christ. And, and it's going to be a sign, correct? Correct. And, but we also know Revelation 12, which is about the birth of Christ. It's also going to be a sign in the sun and the moon and the stars. Revelation 9. What about Revelation 9? Well, 9.1 9, mentions a star that fell from heaven. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so you're going to, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so Revelation 9 is going to be referencing this prophecy of Balaam in a sense as well, right? So there's something about this connection between the sign of Christ and also something about Islam in that there, there's something that I don't fully see yet, but I do know that the Revelation 12 sign prophecy um which was supposed to be uh, fulfilled on September 23rd, 2017, that on that day I'm presenting at Lambert Church, as you know, we've mentioned many times, I'm presenting July 18th as a symbol of the prediction before midnight. And that's going to be something that we later apply to Islam. But the fact that nothing happened in regard to Islam on July 18th, 2020, I think is one of the problems that people have because nothing happened right just like october 22nd 1844 nothing happened nothing that we know of happened but there's a lot going on behind the scenes that we don't right know right exactly so i mean we don't know if our um warning about what was happening at nashville actually averted an attack by islam that's not being shared that's not being revealed um uh, and, and it could be for various reasons. I mean, if, for instance, you know, we made this prediction and somehow um, the American uh, Secret Service was able to to thwart an, a terrorist attack that was targeted for that date, um, they wouldn't necessarily share that information because one is it would show that we were correct, but also they they rarely ever show um what 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 they accomplish unless it's going to benefit them in some way and that might not benefit them but it also could be that islam itself chose not to do the attack because of the warning so so we just don't know and of course you know people on the outside could say well we're just you know making this up nothing happened and we have some kind of lame excuse uh but but i really do think that um, that this prediction is connected to Islam, even though it didn't occur. We, we, we should never dismiss that is 
that prediction, not just that it's the correct date. Now, the event didn't occur, but but what we predicted, the symbols that are there still point to Islam. And this will be understood at some point in the future. Um, so I think this part here and understanding the, the, the message of Jephthah, that it has something to do with this message regarding Islam and that is connected to the story of Balaam and all these other things, I think we need to take our time to examine this and I think we will find something as we do so. Okay. Anyway, our time's up. So. Our time is definitely up for today. So, we will return tomorrow, beginning in Numbers 22-22. We're going to look at this portion. We're going to consider these following 14 verses. We will consider these 14 as they apply to the movement today and as to how we would see this application for ourselves. Any other comment at the moment? I just, um, just going over the story again, uh, we were talking about the chronology. Yes. What occurring after the 30 days of Lauren Aaron's and so forth, there's events, the battle of Shai, uh, against Sihon and Og. Um, but here we are, they are, they're on these here planes, and then the uh, Balak, he's going to send messengers to, to Balaam and Mesopotamia. So that's going to be a journey that took Ezra four months, and then they're going to come back again, and then they're going to be sent again, and then Balaam's going to be coming back again. So I'm just thinking... Obviously, it's, it's going to be a lot quicker than Ezra's time journey, but there's, uh, yeah, just a, uh, just sort of, I was just thinking, how, do, how does that there fit into the time scale? Right. No. Yeah. Well, yeah, it d doesn't necessarily have to be such a long journey because it depends exactly where they go back, but definitely there's time involved. Yeah. So they will be out. Nice. They'd be, they'd be, they would be on these planes and say for quite a few months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that, Stephen. It's well stated. Okay. Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have spent together today. We thank you for this opportunity that we've had to open your word, to consider the examples, and to attempt to place these as to their relevance for us at this time. Be with us, each one. Show us, Father, that that you would have us to do to glorify your character before others. I ask your blessing upon those that have attended today, those that have contributed to this meeting. Be with us, each one. Show us that, Father, that we need. Bring us again tomorrow together, if this is your will. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.